Uh, I'm Larry Wasserman, I'm a pediatrician in town. I'm on the faculty at the med school. At the, right now I'm the director of the newborn nursery, although I did primary care pediatrics for 27 years uh, before that. Uh, I do have two grandchildren and they're toddlers and so uh, this is helpful for me as well. Um, now we're going to talk about, about toddler behavior and, and try to understand where the terrible twos come from and how to get through them as, as easily as possible. Uh, so anyway, you go, most of you guys I suppose have toddlers at home or you wouldn't be here. Uh, can you just shout out some areas where you're having trouble with your toddler's behavior? Anything that you're working on or having difficulties with? Understanding no. No, no is a really good word. We'll talk a lot about no. Yeah, uh, anything else? Because there's a lot of, of common problems that, that toddlers have, uh, that toddlers present to their parents. Um, I got a couple of different titles for this depending on who I'm talking to, but you know, there's a little more sp classical erudite one and then basically just getting through this. Is, you know. <laughs> uh, so areas that you have problems with, I mean, eating, uh, getting to eat what you want to, uh, sleeping, getting to sleep at night, sleeping through the night, those are going to be pretty important issues. Toilet training. Maybe not quite yet, but it's something that's going to be coming towards you in, in the near future. And it's an important issue. Uh, a lot of people have a lot of, if, of issues over toileting. Uh, aggressive behavior is often a problem. Kids can t tend to be aggressive. We tend to be an aggressive species, and the toddlers are just like that. Uh, tantrums, when toddlers don't get what they want, tantrums can be a challenge to deal with. I had a couple of those with my own children in the middle of the Bashford Manor Mall, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but it, it sort of comes down to, you know, who sets the rules? Who is the one who says what goes? And a lot of parents who have very active, strong-willed toddlers who are very not easily distracted, work really hard, they're difficult to deal with. It's hard sometimes to... to to get control of them and to have them understand that they should be listening to you. And we're going to talk about why that happens and then that's kind of some things that you can do to get there. So let's figure out how do, how do we go from this little seven and a half pound bundle of joy that comes out in the nursery uh, to a two-year-old negative oppositional saying no, not doing anything you want to. How do we get from one place to the other? So let's think about what, what is life like as a newborn? What is, what is, what, what, what's the newborn's experience like? Well, newborns are, are sort of in a state of nirvana in that they're at one with the universe. They think it's all me. They don't understand that there's a difference between me and everything else. It's basically all me. I don't, they don't have understanding that there are other people. It's just the universe is me. And they express their needs to the universe by crying. A uh, newborn cries when something is wrong. And from a new parent's perspective, that newborn cry is a really powerful message. Hey, there's a problem here. You need to come over here and fix this. And so... Newborn, one of the things that happens to them is that they get hungry. And so when they get hungry, they cry. And when they get cry, the caregiver comes over and figures out, oh, it's time to eat. So they get fed. So they cry. The universe responds, and they get fed. And that works pretty well. If they're sitting in an uncomfortable, wet, gooey diaper, and they cry, and someone comes over and realizes, oh, man, we need to change the diaper here. So they get a new diaper. And that works out pretty well, too. You know? um, and if they're lonely, somebody, they cry, and someone comes over and picks them up and holds them. And so all of their needs are pretty much satisfied by the universe responding to their crying. And again, they don't see that this is a separate person taking care of them. It's just the universe, and the universe is all me. It's almost like the caregiver is an arm that the newborn learns to control by crying. If you have a problem, you cry, and the arm comes over, figures out what's wrong, fixes it, and then the arm goes away. And you learn pretty quickly that you can get the arm to come back by crying. If you cry, the arm comes back. And it's really a pretty good system. I mean, pretty much all of your needs are taken care of by this caregiver who you consider to be part of you. Okay? So that's what life is like for the first several months. Uh, and the second, well, I'm, I'm going to skip this for the interest of time. We may come back to it if we have Temple, you know, don't shake your baby. You know. Okay, so in the second half of the first year, there's a change, and the main change is mobility. The infant becomes mobile and starts to be able to move himself through space. Okay, so this is sort of a different experience for the infant in that now he can separate himself from the arm, not just the arm separating from him, which is a little bit different. But more importantly, imagine the scene in the family room. Blanket on the floor where the infant, who has not been crawling yet, immobile, stays on the blanket. And, okay, so babies, they can see real well. They can hear real well. They're, their senses are really, by three months of age, they can see as well as they're ever going to see. And they look around, and this is a pretty interesting world that they find themselves in. And especially in that family room in the corner under the computer desk, there's a whole bunch of really interesting-looking wires. And I would really like to see what those wires feel like. I want to see what they feel like in my mouth. 
babies use their mouth as their number one exploratory organ. Anything that they find, they're going to put in their mouth to see what it feels like. And that's some adaptive value of that because occasionally it might be nutritious. But, you know, but anyhow, they want to put everything in their mouth. That's what they want to do. So second half of the first year, six or seven months of age, babies finally figure out how to crawl, how to move themselves on the ground. They start out by pushing up and then sliding back. And they said, oh, I'm, I'm in a different place. Oh, well, I, I can do that again and be in another different place. And then somewhere around six or seven or eight months of age, they get up on their knees and they start to rock. And then they realize, oh, man, I, I can move forward. And they finally figured out how to put it into first gear and they start to crawl. And so baby's now crawling off that blanket in the family room, making a beeline for those wires. Because uh, I've been looking at them for a while, and I know I, I want to get them in my mouth. So I'm working, and this is hard work crawling when you're first doing it. So I'm working, and everyone's looking, oh, isn't it cute? He's crawling. Now I'm making a beeline for those wires. And I'm getting closer, and I'm getting closer, and I'm, I'm almost, I can almost reach him. And what happens? Mom comes over, picks me up, and says, no, no, you can't play with those wires, and puts me way the hell back on the blanket where I started out 20 minutes ago. Now, again, my interpretation of what mom is is an arm that comes over and does what needs to be done. That's my understanding of what my caregiver is. And here, my caregiver is doing something that I really don't want her to do. What the heck is going on here? She's supposed to be under my control, doing, feeding, doing the things I need to. And here she is doing something I really don't want her to do. I have to stop and rethink my entire universe view. What is the world? How would the world work? I have to realize, OK, this is not someone who's part of me. This is a mom. She's different. She may have her own agenda, her own ent ent entity. She is not me. She's an other. Well, this is a new concept for me, an other. I never thought about others before. And so one thing that we see in the second half of the first year, starting at about eight or nine months of age after babies have been mobile, is what we call stranger anxiety where new babies are suddenly much more wary of strangers who they don't know. And the other side of that coin is they get much more tightly attached to their caregivers. Now, in doing checkups in the office, you can see this change. You go into a three-month-old checkup, and you walk in, you get a big smile and goo-goo, and they're three months old. They want to talk to you and flirt with you and play with you and make eyes with you. They're great. They're a lot of fun to be with. Okay? You go into an 11-month-old for a checkup, and the first thing that happens is their eyes get real big when you walk in the door. And then they grab mom and says, get this guy away from me. I don't know who the hell he is. I keep, leave, me, leave me alone. You know, they become much more anxious around people they don't know. And that's because of this new understanding that it's not all me. There are others out there. And some of the others I know pretty well, mom and dad and my caregivers. And they're real important. I need to have them nearby because they do really good things for me. But everybody else, keep your distance, man. Uh, I don't know who you are. Stay away. Okay? So this is sort of the understanding that the way the world works, that, OK, there are others out there. Well, the concept of others necessarily brings me to the concept of self, which I really didn't have before. Again, it was all one. Now there are others, and then there's a me. There's a me. Holy cow, there's a me. That's really interesting. So babies watch and learn, and they're actually pretty smart. And we're now past the first birthday now. We're into the second year of life. And babies are watching and learning. And they realize, OK, there's a lot of other people out there. Uh, some of those people make rules. You can't eat this. You have to eat that. It's time for a bath. Now it's not time for a bath. You can't wear this. You have to wear that. There are rule makers out there. And then there's the other people out there who follow the rules that the rule makers make. OK, I'm starting to figure out the way the universe works now. People are, make rules, other people follow the rules. All right, so we're getting close to a year and a half, maybe 20 months old, and I have to make a decision here. OK, there's two kinds of people in the world. There are rule makers, and there are rule followers. Which one should I be? Well, as Mel Brooks and Tom Petty have both told us, it's good to be king. So I think I'll be a rule maker. I think I'll be one of those people who makes the rules. Uh, I'm going to be in charge. I'm going to run the world. I can tell everybody what to do. And <laughs> this was brought home to me personally when my daughter was three years old. And I had a six-month-old son. And we were sitting at the table, and he was doing something at the table. And she came over, and she was telling him to do something. And I said, Emily, you, you can't tell Jacob what to do. And she looked me right in the eye, and she said, oh, yes, I can. I can tell everybody what to do. <laughs> and you know, that's where toddlers are at this stage. Okay, I'm going to be, I'm in charge, man. I'm going to stay everybody too. So I, I want to run the world. And I have a couple of problems. 
First problem is I'm only about this high. Okay, so I'm much shorter than most of the people in the world, and that's a little bit of a problem. Uh, by the way, do you know how old you are when you're one half of your adult height? You could, yeah, 22 months, not even two. Most people think three or four, but it's actually 22 months, you're half your adult height. But anyhow, so, so you have this problem. The second problem that you have is that your verbal skills are somewhat limited. You might be making two word sentences, you might not, so you have limited verbal skills. So you have a little bit of problem running the world with those two things against you. So how are you gonna show the world that you're in charge, that you're a rule maker? Well, one way that you can do it is to show the world that you're not a rule follower. So anybody makes a rule, that's, good. that's an affront to my authority. I'm going to say what's become my favorite word now, no. No, 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 no. What a great word. I, no, I can now say no, I don't want to do it. So there's this negative oppositional toddler arising from this seven and a half pound bundle of joy. Okay? And he just wants to be in charge and run the world. This is a difficult proposition for a lot of parents. I mean, you have this little picture who's not, not doing what you, um, your father, you're supposed to listen to me. Well, the toddler has no clue that that's the case. He does not respect your authority. There's no reason for him to respect your authority. He wants to be in charge himself, okay? All right, so let's see where we go from here. So from a parental perspective, this is like a battle. It's like a war. Like, you know, who says what goes? Who's in charge? And so if it's a war, we have to analyze the strengths and weaknesses of both sides. So from the toddler's perspective, what are his strengths? Well, number one strength is that this is the most important thing in the world to him. He's not distracted by taxes and wars and, and what the neighbors think. So if I'm going to have a meltdown at Kroger's because you didn't give me what I wanted, I'm going to have a kicking and screaming fit in the frozen food aisle, I don't really care that the person down the aisle is looking at mom and thinking she's a terrible parent because her kid's out of control. That really doesn't bother me at all. I don't care what anybody thinks. Okay, so I've got that going for me. Okay? So what do parents have going for you? Well, one thing you got is that you're bigger. Okay, just, just imagine for a minute that your toddler's about six inches taller than you. That's just a very scary thought. But here, that thing in bold there, that's probably the most important sentence in this whole workshop. You can decide what's worth fighting over, what's important and what's not important. The toddlers really can't do that. They can't make a hierarchy of importance. Everything is equally important to them. It's all important, I want to be in charge. But parents have some control over really what is worth fighting over. Where should I make my fights? So you have a couple things that you got to pick your battles really carefully. First of all, there have to be battles that are really important to you. Because about the worst thing you can do is say no four times and then say, oh, what the hell, go ahead. What, what does a toddler learn from that? He learns be persistent and they'll give in. And that's not what you want to teach a negative oppositional toddler. So only take your stand in areas where you're willing to be more stubborn than a two-year-old over. And the second thing is don't pick fights that you have no chance of winning. And that's where feeding comes in. You cannot make somebody eat. And that's where toilet training comes in. You can't make them go. You can't stop them from going. You got no control over your kid's sphincters. And if you try to take control, they'll show you you have no control. So you don't want to get that into this battle. There are other ways around that. We'll talk about that in some detail a little bit. All right, so what, what can you do? You want to make a list of the areas where you're having trouble. Okay, and put them in order. The most important one on the top, and then the next, and then the next. And if there are two parents involved, do this together. It's important that you're on the same page with your toddler because I'm sure that divide and conquer was invented by a toddler. Mom says no, go ask dad. You know, that works. And so, so be, be, be aware that you really need to do this together. I talk about safety as 1A there because there are some parents who have such strong-willed oppositional toddlers that they don't think that they can do anything to change their toddler's behavior. And in fact, they can. And safety is the reason, the thing to use for that because even the most negative oppositional kid is usually not that unsafe because parents act differently when their child is doing something that puts them at risk for injury. So if he's jumping up and down on the couch, you might be reading your paper and say, stop that, stop doing that, stop doing that. But if he's heading towards the electrical outlet, screwdriver in hand, you're not going to sit there on the couch and say, don't go there. You're going to get up and you're going to avoid, you're going to eliminate the possibility of your child hurting yourself. Kid's going to run out into the street. You're not going to say, don't run out into the street. You're going to stop him from doing that. You're going to act differently when your child does something. Uh, and kids pick up on that. And they realize, oh man, I keep away from the outlet. You know, dad goes nuts when I get near the electric outlet. Okay. So you make your list. And then 
you know, you could try to control everything on your list, but then you'll be saying no to your kid all day long, and he'll be saying no to you, and that's really no fun for anybody. And you dilute your nose if you use them for things that are not as important. So you want to just work on the most, three most important issues that you have. And you're going to set firm, consistent limits in those three areas. And the rest of them, you're going to bite your tongue. And I really wish you wouldn't do that. But this is number seven on the list. It's not that important to me. And so I'm not going to waste my emotional energy setting limits here when I might say, OK, give, uh, give in, because it's just not Im that important. So you work on the important things and let the other ones slide. And the ones that you let slide often will improve. And the reason why that happens is that you know your kid is wanting to be in charge. He's wanting to show you that he doesn't have to listen to what you're saying. So if you stop setting a limit in an area, he no longer scores. My kids are hey, jumping up and down the couch. I want them to stop. And I used to tell them, stop, stop, stop. And he would look at me and keep jumping. Okay. So instead, I don't say anything. You're jumping, yeah, jump. I don't care. Yeah. He jumps for a little while longer. He looks over at me. He jumps a little more. And I stop saying, don't do it. Well, after a while, jumping on the couch loses its charm. He's no longer scoring points in this battle by jumping on the couch. So jumping on the couch is not that big a deal anymore. So even things that you don't stop working on often will improve if you can eliminate them from the field of, of conflict. Okay? All right. Well, OK, we got one, two, and three, and they're going to get crossed. I mean, he's going to push the limits because that's what he's doing. He wants to see where the limits are. And so that's where discipline comes in. I mean, it's important to distinguish punishment from discipline. Discipline means teach, disciples. You know, it's that the root of that is to teach, not to punish. Um, so when you use it is really important, and the type that you use is important as well. And you basically have a choice between physical punishment and timeout with, at this age kid. In older kids, you have removal of privileges as a, as a lever, and that's very, very helpful. I remember when my son first got his Nintendo, I suddenly had leverage that I didn't have before. You know? If you don't stop that, no Nintendo tonight. Oh, yes, sir, Dad. You know, that was important. So uh, physical punishment, let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, it's a problem. It's a real problem. We have child abuse as a problem in our society, especially in our state, actually. Uh, anybody who works at Cozio Children's Hospital has seen several kids who have been abused to the point of death. How does abuse happen? Does somebody wake up in the morning thinking, OK, I'm going to abuse my child today? No, that's not how it happens. It happens when someone loses their temper, usually in a time of, of physical discipline. Uh, you know, having your little two-year-old defy you is really, really pisses you off. I mean, you're not, again, I'm your father. You're not supposed to defy me. I'm, you're supposed to listen to me. Well, again, toddler hasn't bought into that yet. So it can make you really mad. And if you put that anger and loss of temper into physical punishment, that's the spark that can really blow up on you. Um, suppose aggressive behavior is number two on your list, okay? And you want to teach not child not to be aggressive. He hits Sally at daycare, you come home and you hit him. What does he learn from this? People hit each other. Big people hit little people. This is not a good lesson. Mm -hmm. It eliminates any possible discussion. You can, once you spank your kid, he's now mad at you because you hurt him. And the chance of having any kind of meaningful discussion about what led you to discipline your child is pretty much gone. Pretty much gone. Um, like I say, it, it, as, as pediatricians, I think it's really important that we eliminate physical punishment. You know, there's that bi biblical phrase that everybody calls, you know, spare the rod, spoil the child. The rod in that, if it's translated from the real Hebrew, that rod is not a stick to beat people with. That rod was the shepherd's crook guide to guide the sheep. So spare the rod doesn't mean don't beat your kid. Spare the rod means don't give him direction. Okay, so it's, it's not that spare the rod, spoil the child is not a pro-physical punishment statement, although people use it as such. It means you need to discipline your child. You need to show your child the right thing to do. It's a guiding stick, not a beating stick. So any time anybody quotes that to you, let them know they're mistranslating it from the Hebrew. OK. All right. So time out. Mechanics, one minute per year of age. This is not an hour in solitary confinement, OK? It's one minute per year of age. And I think it's important for it to be behind a closed door if possible. I think the message in Time Out is social isolation. Your behavior is such that I can't stand your company right now, OK? 
Some people say, well, I put him in his room. His room's full of toys. That's no punishment. Well, it's not the toys that toddlers are really interested in. They're much more interested in interacting with their parents. And it's the removal of that interaction that makes time out so important. It makes it very, very powerful. It gives everybody a chance to calm down. Again, your kids define you. It really pisses you off. Give yourself a chance to calm down so that you don't lose your temper and do something that you're sorry about later. I've had some parents say, well, you know, I just tap them on the bottom. I don't really hurt them. I'm not going to abuse my kid. Okay, so you tap him on the bottom, and then he turns to you and says, that didn't hurt. What do you, what do, you do then? You're going to hit him harder? You're going to get your belt out? You're walking down a path that potentially has child abuse at the end of it, and there's no need to go down that path. Uh, gives you a chance to talk about it at the end of the punishment, at the end of the discipline, excuse me. Uh, okay, timeout's almost over, but before you come out, do you know why I sent you to time out? What did you do that led me to send you to time out? Gives the child a chance to talk about it, to give some cognitive understanding of what he did. Maybe even a promise he won't do it again, although it probably won't be kept, but at least it's a thought in, that, in the right direction. And you can say something like, you know, I, I didn't do this because I don't like you. I love you. I'm doing this because I love you. And you might even get a hug at the end of time out that you're not going to get after, after a spanking. Okay. Of course, timeout works much better if it's got time in to contrast with it. So when your child is doing good things, give him praise, make eye-to-eye -eye contact, get down on his level, frequent affectionate touches, talk to him, let him know that you like something that he does. Look for something to praise. Let your child see that he can get your attention by being good, not just by being bad. Okay, okay. so some specific tricks now. Um, offer choices whenever you can. Again, you got someone who really wants to be in charge, so let them make the final decision. You decide what the possible choices are, let them make the final decision. It's not peas or chocolate chip cookies, it's peas or carrots. Which one do you want? Uh, getting my daughter dressed was difficult. I take her shirt out and she said, oh, I don't like that, and she'd throw it across the room. I took out three shirts. Emily, which shirt do you want to wear today? Oh, I get to pick. Well, that's altogether different. I'll take that one, and then the shirt went right on. I don't care what shirt she wears. I just needed her to have a shirt on, okay? So pick the shirt, you decide which one you want, okay? That, re that really works really well. Sometimes you have to think of a face-saving way out. Uh, my son was throwing the basketball against the garage door making a racket, and I wanted him to stop. And I could have gone out there and said, Jacob, stop throwing that ball. I'm in charge. You're not. But instead I said, Jake, could you throw that ball three more times and then stop, okay? And he said, how about four times, Dad? And I said, okay, we'll do four times. And he, and he threw it four times, and he stopped, and I was happy, and he was happy. Okay? So offer a, a, a way out. Okay? Count to three is a, is a shortcut to time out. So kid's doing something, you want him to stop. If you don't stop that by the time I count to three, you're going to time out. The next word out of your mouth has to be one. The next word out of your mouth is two, maybe two and a half, and then three. And once you get to three, discussion is over. You pick up your child, and you put him in time out. Okay. The next time when you start to doing that, as soon as you start counting, he's going to realize, oh man, if I don't want to get the time out, I better stop. Okay. So you can get control a little quicker. And then if you've done it a couple of times when your child is doing something that you both know he shouldn't be doing, you can just look at him and say one, and that immediately will get his attention and he'll know what's coming. And it, it help, helps avoid the timeouts by just giving him a warning that it's coming. Be careful making threats that you're not willing to carry out. It totally undermines your credibility. I mean, the classic one is two and a half hours into a three-hour drive. If you, kids driving. If you don't, kids don't be quiet, I'm going to turn this car around. Yeah, sure, Dad. Two and a half hours into a three-hour, and you're not going to do that. So don't make threats that you're not willing to carry out, because if your bluff is called and you don't carry through, you've undermined your own credibility. You don't mean what you say. I don't have to believe anything you say, because you don't mean what you say. So be careful about making those threats. And then with older kids, you have to be careful about what you're offering. When my daughter was uh, a preteen, she would go to spend frequently going to the movies with her friends on the weekend. And it was a Thursday night, and I wanted her to clean her room. And I said, Emily, if you don't clean your room, you're not going to the movies this weekend. Well, unbeknownst to me, she had already checked the schedule, and there was nothing she wanted to see. So she said, OK, and she didn't clean her room. And at that point, I could not go back and ask her to clean up her room. Because I had offered her a choice, A, clean up your room, go to the movies, B, don't clean up your room, don't go to the movies. That's basically what I said to her. Well, she chose B. I can't go back. So be careful when you're making, again, this is not true for toddlers, but for older kids, you have to really be careful what you're saying. All right, some specific areas now. Feeding. Uh, eating can be a problem. It's rare for a toddler to eat enough to keep his mother happy. 
It's also rare for a toddler to not eat enough to grow normally. And as a pediatrician, now you pull out your growth curves here and you show that this toddler who mom says he doesn't eat anything, he's been growing along the 75th percentile from birth and he's still growing on the 75th percentile, so he's got to be eating something. Okay. Um, you can't, again, you can't make somebody eat, so you should not be trying. Um, up until a year of age, your job as a parent is to put the food in the mouth. Okay? But after a year, that changes, and your job as a parent becomes to put the food on the table. And it becomes the child's job to get it from table to mouth. And a lot of feeding problems that I see around the first birthday are because parents are spoon feeding a kid who does not want to be spoon fed anymore. He wants to do it himself. Me do it, me, me, me. Okay? Allow your child to feed himself. Finger foods, little things that they can pick up. They're going to make a mess. Clean it up afterwards. This is what dogs are for, by the way, is to help with toddler mess food. Um, but anyway, the kids will not starve themselves. I think there's a growth curve here. They're just growth curves that help us show parents that kids are growing normally. Um, if a kid doesn't want to eat, you don't have to eat, okay? If you don't want to eat, you don't have to eat. There's no, no problem with that. We'll see you next meal, bye, okay? Next meal rolls around, put the food on the table. If you want to eat, fine. If you don't want to, you don't have to eat. Don't, don't eat if you don't want to eat, okay? See you at the next meal. Well, by the third meal of the day, whatever's on the table is gonna look pretty good. So again, kids will not starve themselves. Now, I didn't want to eat this meal, and an hour later, Mom, I'm hungry, what are we Well, you can have something to eat then, but what you have, you can have the meal that we didn't eat, or you can have some fruit, or some yogurt, or some raw veggies, or something good. You're not gonna get donuts and cookies and chips. That's junk food. And we're gonna take all of that junk food and put it into a category that we're gonna call dessert. And what is dessert? Dessert is something that you get to eat after you've had a good meal. And so your position at the dinner table is not that you have to eat your dinner, because you don't. If you don't want to eat your dinner, you don't have to eat your dinner. But if you want dessert, then you have to eat your dinner. And then the question is, well, how many peas do I have to eat, Dad, to get dessert? Well, 14 peas will get you dessert. How about 12? All right, how about 13 peas and it's sold, okay? Got the peas in, got the dessert in, everybody's happy, okay? Um, kids who are not real big eaters, can be overwhelmed by a huge plate of food. I mean, you put this big overflowing plate of food in front of him and he looks at it and he says, oh my God, I'm never gonna eat that. I'm never gonna make them happy over this meal. I'm not even gonna bother trying. So little sample, little portions. Put little portions on the plate if you have a kid who's not a great eater. You can always give him more. That's not a problem. Don't overwhelm him with a huge plate of food. Uh, and then vitamins. People get concerned about vegetables uh, at, at about this age. You know, under a year, kids eat pretty much anything. After a year, they start to develop real food preferences. And part of this is just this emerging sense of autonomy. It's me, I, oh, okay, I, I can say, I, I gotta say here. And I'm not gonna eat with that because I, I don't like the way it looks or whatever. And, and somehow green things tend to turn kids off at this age and they don't want to eat vegetables. My daughter about this age went through a white food stage. She would only eat white food. So she had a lot of yogurt and cottage cheese and sour cream and pasta and cauliflower. Imagine that, cauliflower. Wouldn't eat anything. And then, you know, and then when she was 13 years old, she became a vegetarian and all she eats is vegetables now. So just beware with that. But vitamins are about the only thing that you get from vegetables that you don't get from everything else. So if parents are concerned about not eating enough vegetables, worry about vitamin deficiencies, it's a whole lot easier to get a vitamin in in the morning, get a Flintstones in in the morning, and then you don't have to worry about the Brussels sprouts at night. I would still offer them. Again, we still want to want to work on, on presenting a balanced diet. But you don't, at least you don't have to worry about vitamin deficiencies if you get a vitamin in. Uh, even if they never eat another vegetable for the rest of their lives, they're not going to be vitamin deficient if they take a daily vitamin. Okay. 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 If you have a picky kid. Now, if your kid is eating everything, you have a nice balanced diet, there's nothing to be gained by giving them vitamins. Okay. But if you know, if you again, the green stuff and the, then get the vitamin in so you don't have to worry about it. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about toilet training a little bit. Uh, again, can't win, don't fight. You can't make somebody go, you can't make them stop. So you're pr pretty much stuck. Toilet training actually consists of two sentences. Okay, and I usually recommend doing this at about 18 months of age. Getting a potty, bring it home, give it to the child. Say, this is your potty. That's sentence number one. Sentence number two is, it's where you make pee-pee and poo-poo. And that's the end of toilet training. The rest is toilet learning, which is something the child does, not something the parents do. Okay? So 
Uh, it's really unfortunate that the, the ability to control your sphincters arises just about the time that you decide you don't want to listen to what anybody says. <laughs> All right, so what do you do for that? Well, a couple things. One, everybody does this eventually. Okay? There's nobody wearing diapers in kindergarten, so everybody is going to make this developmental step at some point. If you're on their case all the time and pushing and pushing and they have these things where you sit on the toilet and sing songs and eat M&Ms and you're pushing and pushing them, again, these are negative oppositional people. I don't want to do what you want. I don't, I don't know what I want, but I know it's not what you want. If you want me to poop here, this is the last place I want to poop. So you don't want to make it a big battle. If you do make it a big battle, when they eventually do it, and they will, their view of the process is a battle that they lost. I'm giving up and I'm pooping where you want, not where I want. Okay? It's a little reminder every time I poop that I'm a loser. On the other hand, if you can wait and be patient and allow the child to want to do this on his own, then his view of the process is not that he's a loser, but he's, it's his accomplishment. Look what I can do. I can poop on the potty like the big boys. I can wear Batman underpants. I'm pretty damn cool. And then every time he goes to poop, it's a little reminder that he's pretty damn cool. And you know, it doesn't really matter when this happens. I talk to med students. I say, on your med school application, where's your outline? At what age did you get out of diapers? No, nobody cares. It's not important, okay? But it is important how, and it can make it a lot easier. Foster self-esteem. That's what we really want to do for our kids, right? And by letting him decide to make this on his own, he will feel much better about himself than if you browbeat him into doing it. Right? So everybody does this. It will happen, uh, and it'll happen. And it's easy. All you do here, at age two, potty at 18 months and your tooth sentence, at age two, you can start to make some more in interventions. And the intervention is carefully. You don't want to say, let's go to the potty now. Because that's your idea. And you're going to meet negative opposition from a kid who doesn't want to do what you want. So instead of saying, let's go to the potty now, you say, do you need to go to the potty now? And it doesn't sound like a whole lot different to us, but instead of telling them what to do, you're asking for information. Much more benign for someone who was negative and oppositional. Ask right after meals. There's something called the gastrocolic reflex. After you fill up your stomach, you want to empty your bowels. That's really normal. So after meals, you ask the question, do you need to go to the potty? And then you respect the answer. If he says no and he's hopping up and down and you know he's going to go any second, but if he says no, it's more important that you respect that answer than that you catch this pee and not the next one. Okay? So what happens is when kids get close is, you know, they, you ask them, you know, they'll say no because they're negative and oppositional, but they'll think about it for the first time today probably. Oh, potty, I didn't even thought about that. You know, it feels a little full down here. I remember yesterday it felt like this, and 10 minutes later I had a real stinky diaper. You know, maybe this is the time that I need to go to the potty. And so 10 minutes later, they'll say, I need a potty now, and they'll go to the potty now, and boom. If you can wait and allow that to happen, toilet training is almost overnight. Just boom, once they figure out, okay, this is it. This is how you do it. Fine, my son, first time he pooped on the potty, walking down the hall, a little swagger in his gait, and he said, I figured it out. I figured out, what a great line, I figured it out. Anyhow, so toileting, it, it, it's, it's a fun time in that it's a real accomplishment. And there's, there's some nearly neat books. There's a book called Toilet Learning by Allison Mack that I really recommend. It just shows how everybody goes on the potty and won't it be great when you do. Nothing coercive, nothing bad about that at all. Uh, we're a little overdue. Let me do a couple minutes. Just one minute about tantrums and then we'll be done. Tantrums are a behavioral display that your kid puts on to try to get you to change your mind. I want this. No, you can't have it. Boom. It's kind of a throwback to early infancy when they used to cry to the environment to express their needs. I want my toy, I'm going to cry. And you want to get my body involved, I'll get my arms going, but I can't do anything with my legs until I lie down. So that's where they're kicking on the floor screaming. Okay. If you uh, reward the, the tantrum, if you give in, you'll see more tantrums. Kids are very operational. I'll do what works. I, get what I, I don't get what I want. I throw a tantrum. I get it. Well, the next time I don't get what I want, I'm going to throw another tantrum. It just makes a whole lot of sense. So the important thing is not to allow them to be successful. How do you do that? Well, you got about a two-second warning before the tantrum occurs. I want this toy. No, you can't have it. At that point, quick decision. How important is this issue to me? Is this one that I don't care what he does? I'm not giving in. It's important. Then you allow the tantrum to occur. You say, I'm sorry, you're having a hard time, and you walk away. And frequently what will happen then is the kid will get up, follow you, and fall down at your feet again with the tantrum. Because, you know, a tantrum is a show, and if there's no audience, it makes no sense. So you have to have somebody watching you, otherwise why throw a tantrum? So that helps parents see that this is not a distressed child. This is a kid who's putting on a show, trying to get me to change my mind. Now, on the other hand, if it's something that you would give in if, if he threw a tantrum, give in before the tantrum. Give in before he has a chance to blo blossom the tantrum. If you can do that, if there's a tantrum going on, you've already decided not to reward it. No tantrums get rewarded. Psych 101, no rewards, behavior extinguishes. Really pretty simple. Okay. All right, I'm going to stop there because we're pretty much out of time. Let me just... Uh,
Oh, we'll just put that last slide up there. Uh, I do have a blog that I recommend. It's called, it's at toddler.blogspot.com. Let me see if I can get it up here. Yeah, there it is. Okay. Uh, welcome comments. I've got a bunch of things on there on topics. Uh, you're welcome to comment on it. I've been, you know, I kind of monitor it, and so I'll try to answer comments if there are any up there. What was the name of the book you said? Really good Toilet book. Learning by Allison Mack, M-A-C-K. I've seen it on Amazon, so it's there. Okay. All right. Any questions? Any comments? No, oh, good. Yeah, I'm glad. Parenting yeah. Is Parenting is cool. I mean, adolescence is sort of a, 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 almost a mirror image of toddlers in that, you know, at the end of toddlers, in the toddlerhood, in the negative oppositional, kids realize, okay, parents are in charge. I, I, that's the way the world, I understand now that parents are in charge, kids are not. So what's the next, next best thing to do if you can't be in charge? Suck up to the people in charge. So <laughs> school age kids, five, six, seven, eight year olds, they want to make their parents happy. They are looking for ways to, to make their parents happy. Now, 13, 14 year olds, not so much. They're going through adolescence. In adolescence, the same sort of battles come up over who's in charge. The difference is the toddlers want to run everybody's life. Adolescents just want you off their case. Just let me run my own life. Leave me alone. Okay? Mark Twain had a great line about adolescence. Mark Twain said, when I was 13, my father was dumb and ignorant and didn't know anything. And I was amazed by the time I got to be 21 how much the old man had learned. <laughs> so there is the other side of adolescence when they do come out and they come out to be real people <laughs> and they realize it. And especially when your kids have kids, now that I'm a grandparent, when your kids have kids, the whole thing changes. You know, we see the parent-child relationship as a child just from the child side. You have no clue about the parental side of the parent-child relationship until you have your own child. And once you have your own child, you realize what parents go through. And all of a sudden, the respect for your own parents just grows. Holy cow, how did you do that, Dad? You know, I mean, you realize that there's a whole other side here that you really are not aware of until you have your own children. And that's one of the things that makes grandparenting pretty cool, is to watch your children be parents. It just kind of blows you away sometimes. It's, it's really fun to watch. All right. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate your attention.